Hi everyone, and welcome to my guide on how to play the center role. In this video, I'll be going over everything you need to know about getting started in the center role. What the center role is, how you play the center role, which Pokemon you should send into the center, an example of item builds and center clears for the Pokemon that are common in the role. Please check the video description for timestamps if there is anything specific that you are wanting to know or reference. However, I recommend that you watch the entire video as you might learn something new. Please comment down below if you think I've missed out on anything important or if you run a different build on your Pokemon when you go center. Let's dive right into it. What is the center? In Pokemon Unite, there is a top lane and a bottom lane. The center refers to the space in the map between the two lanes. Some players will also call this the jungle if they used to play Dota or League of Legends. The center of the map is split into two halves, one for each team. Although the map does have two sides, a grass side and a sand side, you always play from left to right. You can also tell which side you are on when you join a game depending on what side your portrait is on. If you are on the purple side, you are on the grass side. If you are on the orange side, you are on the sand side. You can also tell what side you are at the very beginning of the game when it zooms in as you can see the area above the starting position and it's either grassy or sandy. Now let's talk about why you would want to go into the center. In Pokemon Unite, when you kill wild Pokemon, you gain experience. When you are with other Pokemon on your team, the experience is shared by the Pokemon who are around with the majority going to the Pokemon who landed the killing blow. Because Pokemon respawn regularly, you want to be killing as many wild Pokemon as possible as a team to maximize your team's experience gain. If no one goes into the center, then the experience that could be gained from the wild Pokemon in the center goes to waste. Now there are a number of reasons why you would want to go into the center or you would want to take certain Pokemon into the center rather than going into lane. The first reason is that there is more experience in the center. You will hit level 5 after clearing out all the wild Pokemon in the center while the Pokemon in lane will still be level 4. Quite a number of Pokemon evolve or learn new moves at level 5, which means when they go into a lane after they finish their center clear, they will have a larger impact than if they were level 4. The second reason is that the Pokemon might have a weaker early game. To balance the game, Pokemon who are strong at the end of the game are generally weaker at the start of the game. Therefore, you might want to take some of these Pokemon into the center to give them that initial experience boost so that they become stronger faster. Because they usually won't be enemy Pokemon in the center, you will usually be able to level up in peace and skip past your weakest phase. The third reason is that some Pokemon just aren't good in lane. Some Pokemon struggle to lane in general. This could be because they have a weaker early game or they just don't have many ways of dealing with the opposing team's Pokemon. All rounders such as Machamp and Garchomp for example have no way of engaging onto the enemy team early on and would get bullied by the other team. Other Pokemon such as Talonflame and Absol might have no problems jumping onto the enemy team. However, because of their low defensive stats, if they do not manage to kill the enemy team when they jump in, they're not going to be able to walk out. The fourth reason is that your Pokemon has high mobility. This game was initially designed to have speedsters take the center role. With their high mobility, they can show up anywhere on the map to lend a hand or to catch the enemy out of position. This normally takes the form of an assassination playstyle where you take the farm in the center while keeping an eye on the map as you plan your next strike. The idea is that you swoop in for the kill, score if you can, then either go back to base and heal and continue farming in the center or you just return directly to the center. Because there is limited vision in the center of the map, you can take advantage of this to surprise the enemy team. So then who normally does go center? On the screen, I have the more common choices for centered Pokemon. Currently, the most popular Pokemon are Blastoise, Cinderace, and Greninja. All the other Pokemon that you can see are also viable in the center and see varying levels of play. Later in this video, I'll be giving example builds as well as some sample clears using each of the Pokemon in this image. For those Pokemon who aren't here, although it is possible for them to go into the center, they either clear the center too slowly, which negates any benefits they would have obtained by going to the center, or they are so dominating in lane that you'd be better off letting someone weaker in early game go into the center instead. So how does one go center? The first thing to do when you decide to go center is to select a Pokemon and declare to the team that you are going to the center. If the people on your team have any experience in playing the game, they will notice this and choose a Pokemon that will either go top or bottom lane. It is center etiquette to give the center role on a first come first serve basis. However, in a situation where someone else on your team also selects a Pokemon and locks in the center position, it usually devolves into one or two outcomes. In the first outcome, the two of you spam I'm going center until one of you changes into a lane. And the second outcome is that you both end up going center lowering your chances of winning the game as you've doomed one of your laners to take on two Pokemon on their own. 
Next, I'll be showing some Sensei gameplay using Talonflame and talk about what you should be doing in an ideal game leading up to the first Dreadnought. After the first Dreadnought, things get a little messy and you need to use your own judgement and decide how to carry out the rest of the game. Before we get to the gameplay, I want to take an opportunity to talk about the Pokemon in the center and what they do. The first Pokemon you'll run into is Lil Pup. When you hit the Lil Pup, the Lil Pup will run towards the spawning location of the Ludicolo. You can tell where the Ludicolo will spawn based on the side of the map you're on. On the grassy side, the Ludicolo spawns on the top alcove, and on the sandy side, the Ludicolo will spawn in the bottom alcove. The next Pokemon is Ludicolo. When killed, Ludicolo gives a blue buff that increases your damage to Pokemon with low HP. This means it will let you kill wild Pokemon faster, kill the enemy Pokemon faster, and kill objectives faster. The Bufalan, when killed, gives you a red buff that slows enemies when you hit them. This makes it easier for you to chase down the enemy team and deploy hit and run tactics. The last Pokemon you'll find in the center are the Corefish. The Corefish are food. They're there for you to eat up so you can hit level 5 after you're clear. This is very important and it is good etiquette for laners not to take any of the Corefish from the center player. However, if for some reason one of your laners does take one of the Corefish, what they're actually saying to you is that they're willing to donate one of their Corefish to you as tribute, specifically the one that spawns at 9 minutes, or that they don't require your assistance this game. This actually works both ways. If the center player decides to hit your APOM on the way to the center, what they're actually trying to say is, feel free to take my callfish. Every piece of experience counts in this game, and sharing it with other people will stop Pokemon from hitting their power spikes when they need it. If you are struggling in lane, then the only person who can help you in that situation is the person who goes center. If you take their callfish, then all you're doing is weakening them, so even if they are a saint and try to help you after you've sabotaged them, you've just increased the chances that you're all going to die when they attempt to save your lane. Now that that's out of the way, let's dive into the center walkthrough. The first thing you need to do is you need to decide where you want to end up after you clear the center. There are a number of things to take into account when making this decision. The first question you should ask yourself is, can your laners hold on if you don't go? If you have weak laners, they might require your help to stabilize their lane or to hit a power spike that will help them turn the lane in their favor. The second question is, can you get a kill if you go there? Getting a kill coming out of the center usually translates into a dunk, which swings the game in your favor. And the last question is, which laners do you want to help given the chance? The answer to this question is usually, who is in the bottom lane? There are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, it's not guaranteed that your top lane comes down for the Dreadnought, so getting your bottom lane ahead for the coming Dreadnought is a good thing. Secondly, if you manage to break the enemy's outer point at the bottom, then you will have a massive advantage over the first Dreadnought, as they won't have the berries up to heal. So in this game, I want to go bottom after my first center clear. After killing the Ludipop, I go for the Corefish because I don't want to waste time waiting for the Ludicolo to come up. After killing the Corefish, I come back for the Ludicolo and then I go for the Bufalon. I make sure to dodge the Bufalon's charge to save some time because if it knocks you up, you do lose about 2 seconds. After killing the Bufalon, I go for the last Corefish and make my way towards the bottom lane. You can see that I've finished my clear about 9 minutes and 10 seconds, so it's about this time that you should be very careful if you are playing in a lane. When you get into lane, you want to take stock of the situation. If your team is fighting, try to jump in and help them out. What's important here is that the best Queens and the combis will spawn at 8 minutes and 50 seconds. The best case scenario is that you take out the enemy team, leaving your team free to take out the bees and dunk your points. However, what will usually happen is that a fight will break out and each team will scramble for as much of the bees as possible. If you're not able to dunk freely, you should back out of the lane and start heading back into the center. Depending on how smoothly your trip to lane went, you might need to go back to base and heal. If you have the opportunity, you should take the callfish in the center of the map. For your second clear of the center, you definitely want to end your clear at the bottom so that you can be at the bottom lane for the 720 bees and prepare for the fight at Dreadnought, which spawns at 7 minutes. Depending on how much time you have, you can consider skipping the two Corefish and return to the bottom lane after getting the Ludicolo and the Bufalon. If you see an opportunity, you can go top lane instead to help your top lane. Just make sure that you're back in the bottom lane by 7.30 at latest. However, if you do decide to go top lane, if you don't manage to pick up a kill up there, you might be behind as you wouldn't have time to clear your center the second time, meaning you might be under level for the Dreadnought fight. Coming to the bottom lane earlier means that the enemy team might not be expecting you to already be there. This might lead to an opportunity where you can take out the enemy team before the combi spawn. The best case scenario is that you take out the enemy team, allowing your team to freely take the Dreadnought. The second best case scenario is for your team to have broken the outer point so they no longer have any barriers, allowing you to grind them down and forcing a fight and take the Dreadnought. Just remember that at the start of the game, the respawn timers are quite low, so even if you do kill them, they might be back in lane and rejoin the fight before your team manages to clear the Dreadnought. In most games, 
all five people from both teams should come to the bottom. However, there are cases where one person from each team stays top lane. This is usually so that they can quickly take the Rotom before coming down while the four of you hold off the rest of the enemy team. If one team has four people at the bottom and the other team has five people at the bottom, it is in the favour of the team that has four people at the bottom if they can drag it out as long as possible. This gives their top laner as enough time to kill the Rotom and push it into the point and make their way down. This puts pressure on the team with Fireberg 1 to force a fight and get the Dreadnought before the other team regroups. Killing the Dreadnought gives your whole team experience and a shield. This boost makes it easier for your team to continue the fight because of the shields or because you may have evolved and gained a Unite move if you did not have it previously. If possible, fight the other team and take their outer point if it is still up. If it is already down or you do not think that you can break it because they're defending it too well, you should head to the top lane and get the Rotom if it's still there. Killing the Dreadnought or the Rotom starts a 2 minute timer before they come back. 30 seconds before they respawn, a timer will show up on the minimap. Generally, if you killed the enemy team at Dreadnought, they would have given up on the Dreadnought and tried to clear out the Rotom before your team can rotate up to the top lane. In this game, the bots have already taken the Rotom by the time I arrived, which means that the major objectives on the map are now down. Up to this point is the most crucial part for the center role. After the first Rotom and the first Dreadnought, in most players' minds, everything is up for grabs, so laners might take your wild Pokemon in the center, including the Ludicolo and the Bufalon. At this point, it's okay as your job is now to farm up as much as you can as a team, defend your points, and get ready for the second Dreadnought, which shows up 2 minutes after the previous one was killed. Remember to keep an eye on the respawn timer and get there before it spawns so that you can get in position with your team for a fight. Now I'll be showing an example of a clear if you want to end up on the opposite side of the map after your center clear. I'll still be using Talonflame in this map so you can use it as a comparison video. This path is one of the options you have and is usually the one that you will take if you're using a Pokemon that can't clear the Lil Pup quickly. Because you have to wait for the Ludicolo to spawn, for Pokemon who can't actually get over the initial wall at the start of the game with that eject button, you can go around the wall and still make it on time. After killing the Lil Pup, you kill the Ludicolo, the Bufalant, and then the Corphish closest to the Bufalant before going to the opposite side and clearing out the last Corphish before heading into lane. Although this route is a little slower as you have to wait for the Ludicolo to spawn, you will still make it to lane before the best of queens and the combi spawn at 8 minutes and 50 seconds. Therefore, it is important to remember that if you are playing lane, you should be careful leading up to the bees spawning, as you don't know what lane the enemy centre player will be going for after they are clear. Because this route is slightly slower, sometimes your laners might decide to take your last callfish. In which case, when you go into the lane, you also take their callfish. Now that we've discussed how to play the center role, let's discuss each of the Pokemon that would usually take the center role. I'll be giving my thoughts on each Pokemon as well as the build that I use for them. In the background, I'll also be showing an example clear using the build that I'm using to give you a rough idea of how long it takes each Pokemon to clear the center and how effective they are in the center role. This is all personal opinion and the item choices are all my personal preference. I am by no means claiming that my builds are the best builds for each Pokemon. If you use different Pokemon or have different builds for the Pokemon that I have in the video, please comment them down below. I'll be going over each Pokemon in alphabetical order. To skip ahead, use the video chapters or check the description for the timestamps. Let's get started. Absol is a feast or famine assassin who lives and dies by his critical strikes. Luckily, Absol's chances of landing critical strikes is the best in the game and all his abilities can crit. He starts the game with a 15% crit rate and will get 25% by the end of the game without any items. For Absol, I take Night Slash and Psycho Cut. Psycho Cut slows the enemy and increases your damage for the next 3 attacks against them. With the slow from Psycho Cut, it makes it easier to land Night Slash, and landing one Night Slash means you get another one, giving you the option to dash out or to go in for another attack. If there's anyone out there who actually uses Sucker Punch, please let me know because I can't see any situation where it would be useful even with the recent buffs it has received. For held items, I use Scope Lens, Razor Claw, and Muscle Band. I'm basically all in with this Pokemon. I have one game plan and that is to go in and get the kill and walk away. Scope Lens and Razor Claw I feel are must have items. If these items are level 30 then it bumps Absol's critical rate to 36.1% at level 9 and as all his skills can crit, your burst damage becomes insane. I'm running Muscle Band currently but it might actually be on the chopping block. The increased attack speed does not really help my burst combo of Psycho Cut, Auto Attack, Night Slash, Auto Attack, Night Slash, Boosted Attack as your attack animation is reset when you cast a new ability. Weakness Policy is a contender for a replacement as it also increases your attack damage and it increases your attack further if they decide to fight back. For my battle item, I use Eject Button. Since I'm going all in with my build, having an escape option in case I go too deep can be useful and it can help me close the gap further if I see a kill just outside my usual range. Blastoise is a defender who does way too much damage for a defender. 
He became a popular center Pokemon the moment he was released, displacing Cinderace and Greninja as the most popular Pokemon to send into the center. There are a lot of reasons for this, but the main one is that the amount of damage he puts out with his Unite move and his Rapid Spin Water Spout combo is ridiculous. Therefore, I take Rapid Spin and Water Spout on him instead of Hydro Pump and Surf when I go into the center. Although Hydro Pump and Surf are also good skills, they are more useful in defending points and objectives rather than burning down objectives. Putting Blastoise in the center means that he will have his combo before the first Dreadnought, and if you're having a really good game, you'll have your Unite move before the first Dreadnought. Between your Unite move and your Rapid Spin combo, you can probably take out more than half of the enemy team and go for Dreadnought, Rotom or Zapdos after the enemy team is dead. The unstoppable effect on the Rapid Spin also makes your attempts at securing the objectives more likely to succeed as they cannot stop you from outputting damage without killing you. I take Fluffy Tail as my battle item on Blastoise to help me burst down the objectives. I've seen other Blastoises take Eject Button, but I believe that the benefits of Eject Button do not outweigh the ability to secure endgame objectives. For held items, I take Focus Band, Score Shield, and Buddy Barrier. Blastoise already has enough damage in his kit, so my selection of items is to make him as tanky as possible so that I can keep dishing out damage for my team. Another item consideration is the Wise Glasses or the Choice Specs to increase your skill damage. I'd probably take out the Score Shield for one of these items. Charizard is an all-rounder with a weak early game who becomes a monster as he evolves. He is also the only Pokemon in the game who doesn't need to stop moving to attack, which makes it easier to dodge skills and chase people down. He has a lot of move options and it usually comes down to what type of playstyle you prefer. I personally prefer playing with Fire Plunge and Flare Blitz, which lets me get in and disrupt the actions of one of their Pokemon, which usually is Cinderace or Greninja. You have a lot of ways of closing the distance with Disruptions, a Shield, and with the recent change to his Unite move, it increases your single target burst, even more before you rain fire on the rest of the enemy team. Because my goal is to stick onto someone, I run X Speed, which is the less popular option. I take X Speed, as it makes me immune to slows, and it gives me a minor speed boost. The other build is to run Flamethrower and Fire Blast, which deals damage over a larger area. Fire Blast is actually Charizard's highest damaging skill if the enemy stays in it, so if your team has a way of locking the enemy down, this may be the way to go. For held items, I use Scope Lens, Muscle Band, and Focus Band. Although Charmander's critical rate is really low, he evolves to Charizard, he has a 20% crit rate, and with Scope Lens, around 1 in 4 attacks will be doing more than double damage. As his auto attack hits 4 times, you're more likely to land a critical hit and the scope lens will activate, dealing even more damage. I take muscle band for the attack speed and the focus band for the defensive stat, as I expect I'll be taking a beating from the enemy team. Cinderace has always been a popular choice for the center lane, and with his recent buffs it makes this even more so. He has a weak early game, but he provides a lot of damage from range when he levels up. For skills, I like to go blaze kick and flame charge. Before the flame charge changes and the introduction of the razor claw, faint was often picked over flame charge. However, with the lower cooldown of Flame Charge and the extra mobility that it brings, I've leaned more towards Flame Charge. I also prefer to go Blaze Kick over Pyro Ball as it gives me another way of distancing myself from the enemy Pokemon who jump onto me. I would probably only go Pyro Ball if the enemy team had no way of getting onto me and I had a strong front line in front of me. For items, I like to go Scope Lens, Muscle Band and Razor Claw. Cinderace is very auto attack heavy and all of these items synergize well with his playstyle. The boost to the damage from the Razor Claw when you use your skills is also a generous boost to his damage output. For battle items, I flip flop between X Speed, Full Heal, and Eject Button. I like how X Speed gives me that extra ability to weave in and out of the fight, but I also like how Full Heal makes me immune to crowd control for a while, allowing me to continue outputting damage. However, often what you will need is the Eject Button to get you out of sticky situations. Garchomp is one of those Pokemon who should be going center whenever he has the opportunity. He is very weak in the early game and he hits his power spikes much later than other Pokemon. However, if he is able to hit the late game, he becomes a monster who is very difficult to deal with. Although Dragon Claw and Dragon Dive is the more popular moveset at the moment, I personally prefer going for Dig and Earthquake. I like the knock up on the Dig and the AoE slow on the Earthquake, allowing me to stick to the enemy team and get more auto attacks off. One important thing to keep in mind with Garchomp is that you don't want the stacks of your boosted attack to fall off, as attacking with maximum stats lets you shred down the enemy's Pokemon and heal on your attacks. This lets you survive situations that you probably wouldn't on any other Pokemon, so remember to keep those stacks up. For held items, I take Scope Lens, Muscle Band, and Focus Band. Muscle Band is a must-have item as you want to be auto-attacking as much as possible. The percentage health damage that it provides stacks with your percentage health damage of your passive, allowing you to mow down champions and objectives. I run Scope Lens for the critical hit and Focus Band for survivability. 
I'm currently considering switching out the scope lens for another defensive item to help me survive longer. Maybe something in the middle like weakness policy which further increases my attack when I take damage from the enemy team. On Guard Chomp, I take Eject Button for the extra mobility, but I have seen people have some success with Fluffy Tail as well, as they burn down objectives like Dreadnor, Rotom, and Zapdos. Gardevoir usually goes into the center because of her weak early game. Like Guard Chomp, her power spikes come later than other Pokemon at level 6 and level 10, which you shouldn't be able to hit after your first clear. However, the damage and crowd control she brings to the table when she fully evolves more than makes up for it. For skills, I prefer Moonblast and Psyshock. Shock. I like how Moonblast stuns and provides a shield, although a case can be made for Psychic as it lowers the enemy's special defense, meaning you deal more damage with your other skills. I also prefer the mobility provided by Psyshock Shock over the delayed casting of Future Sight. Even though the damage potential of Future Sight is higher, Psyshock Shock is much easier to land, bringing more consistent damage when I play it. For held items, I take Choice Specs, Wise Glasses, and Buddy Barrier. Gardevoir has the highest special attack in the game, meaning that she benefits from items that further boost her special attack or make use of it. Choice Specs will increase her burst damage and Wise Glasses gives all her spells a nice boost. Being quite squishy, I like to run Buddy Barrier her as an emergency item. It bolsters her early game HP and also provides a shield at the end of the game when she uses her Unite move. For battle items, I use Eject Button. Once she loses her Teleport at level 6, she loses all of her mobility, and as a squishy spellcaster, you need to be alive to be dealing damage. Gengar is an assassin who has fallen out of favor recently. Hopefully his new Hollowear will give him the exposure he needs to return to the limelight. He has a relatively weak early game and relies on comboing his skills together to get the most out of his abilities. One thing I should mention before talking about the build that I'm using is that his boosted attack allows him to go through walls which is useful for getting over the initial wall to the little pub. This means that you don't have to use eject button to speed up your clear. In regards to ability, although Shadow Ball and Dream Eater has been on the rise, I feel that with the new items Sludge Bomb and Hex may be the way to go. Shadow Ball Dream Eater has a lot more range and burst as well as sustain, however everyone knows what happens when Gengar is able to get multiple hexes off during a team fight. The problem with Gengar was that his item choices were quite limited. Other than Wise Glasses, none of the other items in the game really synergized well with his kit, so people often opted for Shell Bell and Special Attack Specs as a second alternative. However, now with the introduction of Choice Specs and Razor Claw, Gengar finally has 3 items that he can use to this full potential. Choice Specs improves his burst damage even further, and Razor Claw greatly increases his damage output if you weave auto attacks in between his hex activations. However, I found out during testing that the slow provided by the Razor Claw does not reset the cooldown of his hex. It would be cool if Gengar could get off infinite hexes, however that would seem like a bug. Regardless, the Razor Claw activation should add up to a considerable amount of damage, especially if you get multiple hexes off during a battle. For battle items, I take Eject Button for the extra mobility. Greninja is one of the most popular Pokemon to send into the center. Although it is possible for him to lane with the help of a support, if he goes into the center, he can complete his first evolution before coming out, giving him access to Smokescreen and bypassing his weakest phase. For Greninja, I like to use Smokescreen and Surf, which is the standard build for Greninja. This might have changed with the recent buffs to Water Shuriken and Double Team and their interaction, where the mirror images can also throw Water Shurikens. However, I prefer the executability of the Surf and the Vision Denial aspect of the Smokescreen. It just feels like there is more potential for outplay when you take Surf, as killing a unit with Surf resets its cooldown, allowing you to combo for a lot more damage when enemies are low. For items, I like to go Scope Lens, Muscle Band, and Razor Claw. As a ranged carry, I go all in on the offense. Greninja has a ridiculous amount of mobility, so as long as you play carefully, you shouldn't need to run defensive items. The extra damage provided by Razor Claw synergizes very well with both Surf and Smokescreen. With this build, you have to be a lot more careful about when you use your Unite move because you don't have Buddy Barrier. Generally, when you use your Unite move as Greninja, you're going to be very close to the enemy team after you use it. For battle items, I take Full Heal or Eject Button for insurance and extra mobility. Being able to full heal during an objective fight allows you to ignore crowd control and try for the steal. Lucario is a Pokemon who can go into the center, however, because of his dominating performance in the lane, most people opt to send Lucario into the top or bottom lanes instead. His passive's interaction with score shield is underutilized in the center where there are no goals to score. For Lucario, I like to go Power Punch and Bone Rush. 
Hikari is a very mobile Pokemon that packs a lot of damage in his base kit. Power Up Punch does more damage the lower health Pokemon has, which makes him really good at stealing objectives from the enemy team. Bone Rush also adds a lot of extra mobility to his kit, and also resets the cooldown of his Power Up Punch at higher levels. His other skill, Extreme Speed, is also a very powerful attack. Where Extreme Speed excels is when you're going against a large number of Pokemon. When Extreme Speed hits a new target for the first time, the cooldown of Extreme Speed resets, allowing you to use it again. This makes him very strong at clearing the Vesper Queen, as well as a very mobile fighter during team fights. Because he has so much damage in his base kit, for held items I just build him tanky. I run Focus Band, Buddy Barrier, and Razor Claw. I'm running Extreme Speed with Razor Claw in this video. Razor Claw works really well with the Extreme Speed because of the resets. However, because I prefer Power Up Punch, I'm considering swapping over into Weakness Policy instead. As Weakness Policy increases his attack stat, and with his massive attack scalings, it will strengthen his Power Up Punch as he takes damage, giving him a better chance of taking the objective. For battle items, I take Eject Button to increase his already high mobility. Machamp is one of those Pokemon who if he goes into lane, he will just get bullied until he reaches level 5. This is because he has no way of getting in on the ranged attackers unless he eject buttons. In which case, unless he kills the enemy Pokemon, he'll most likely die in the process. For Machamp, I'm a big fan of running Submission and Cross Chop. Submission is self-explanatory and is probably one of the strongest moves in the game. Being unstoppable forces the enemy Pokemon to either eject button away or risk getting flipped towards your team. As for Cross Chop, I like how it provides a dash and increases his critical rate allowing him to do more damage in a short amount of time. You can also use Cross Shop to get over some walls as well. For items, because Machamp has a lot of crit in his kit, I run Scope Lens, Razor Claw, and Focus Band. At the end of the day, Machamp is running towards the enemy team, so it's likely that he's going to take a lot of damage as the enemy team sees him approaching. Therefore, I run Focus Band in order to give him a little bit more tankiness. As for Scope Lens and Razor Claw, they both further increase his crit rate and burst damage. Being able to Submission, Auto Attack, Cross Chop, Auto Attack should delete quite a few Pokemon or put them in a state where they're running for their lives. Also, did anyone notice how Submission procs the Razor Claw? Apparently it counts as an Auto Attack. For Battle Items, I run Eject Button as sometimes I want to use it during Submission to surprise someone, but I often use it to get away when my Submission is down. Mr. Mime is an unconventional Pokemon to send sensor. The reason why he is in this list is that his impact on the game is quite strong as his burst damage is incredible and the walls that he can put up can turn a fight in your team's favour. Mr. Mime has a surprisingly fast clear time after he gets his confusion at level 4. This is because in the sensor, there are walls behind each wild Pokemon causing his confusion to do increased damage. However, even before that, Fake Out has really high base damage, allowing him to clear out the wild Pokemon fairly quickly as well. For Mr. Mime, I like to go Confusion and Barrier as I feel that it has more impact on the state of the game. Landing a good Confusion Barrier combo can win a team fight, or it can be used to zone enemy Pokemon from objectives. To be honest, after Mr. Mime learns Confusion and ganks a lane, you could probably send another Pokemon into the center to benefit from the increased experience as he has all the tools he needs at that point. Here I should have just walked around the Pokemon instead of trying to block him with Light Screen. For held items, I run Choice Specs, Focus Band, and Buddy Barrier. At the end of the day, Mr. Mime is a support and tank. He brings to the table a lot of crowd control, and he is melee, so he's often right up in the enemy team's face, or around there. I find that the burst damage offered by Choice Specs is more than the damage offered by running Wise Glasses, and there is only a 2 second difference between Confusion's cooldown and the Choice Specs' internal cooldown, which means your Confusion will almost always be doing boosted damage. For battle items, I take Eject Button, as he definitely needs it for the mobility, as the only other mobility he has is in his Unite move. Talonflame is basically an aerial strike in a Pokemon. He comes in from the sky, dive bombs the enemy team, and you should hope that after the damage is done, everyone is dead. Otherwise, he might be in a little bit of trouble. Poor skills are like going Aerial Ace and Brave Bird. The range of Brave Bird is insane, and you can often catch people by surprise as you cast it from out of sight, allowing you to pick up kills and objectives. You can also use it to dive bomb points if the enemy is too far forward, allowing you to get in a sneaky dunk. As for Flame Charge and Aerial Ace, I prefer Aerial Ace as I feel like it further increases his burst damage, making his next attack boosted. However, against a team with more defense, I can see Flame Charge being the pick. 
One thing to note with Talonflame is you can't clear the center too quickly. If you clear the center too quickly, you won't hit level 5 and that means you won't evolve by the time you hit the lane. Although you get passive experience over time, you can't evolve with that passive experience and you need to be involved in the kill of a Pokemon. Make sure you kill the last Corphish after 9.15. For held items, I take Razor Claw, Scope Lens and Muscle Band. Razor Claw synergizes really well with Talonflame's kit, allowing him to put out a lot of damage during his burst combo as long as he weaves in auto attacks, which he should already be doing. Because I plan on dumping all of my damage on the enemy team and aim for the kill, I don't take any defensive items. However, if this is a concern, you can consider swapping out the scope lens for a focus band or body barrier. Unfortunately, Razor Claw is just too good to give up. For battle items, I take the eject button as an emergency escape if the enemy team is still alive after I finish my combo. I don't often see Venusaur going center, mainly because he is such a strong laner. However, with the changes to Giga Drain and Petal Dance, I can see more jungle Venusaurs coming into play. Venusaur is now a team fighting monster with his Petal Dance and Giga Drain. Both of Venusaur's builds are good, Sludge Bomb and Solar Beam allow you to snipe and secure kills from a distance, while Petal Dance and Giga Drain allow you to wreak havoc in the enemy team up close and personal. Personally, I still prefer the Solar Beam build because I prefer to fight from range, but the Petal Dance build makes you surprisingly tanky while dishing out a lot of damage. No matter which build you decide to go with, taking Venusaur into the center will mean that he will have both builds up and ready before the first Dreadnought. The flexibility of his builds means you can decide what build to go after seeing the enemy team composition. For held items, I take Muscle Band, Focus Band and Body Barrier. Venusaur has a really strong boosted attack which also stuns the enemy team, so getting more boosted attacks is always a good thing. I also like to take Focus Band and Body Barrier to make him a little bit more tanky. These items work in both builds, but if you're fully committing to playing Solar Beam Venusaur and are confident of your positioning, then you can probably swap out the Focus Band for the choice specs to increase your damage. I take Eject Button as my battle item as it lets you retreat if you're playing Solar Beam Venusaur and lets you get right into the enemy team if you're playing Petal Dance Venusaur. However, a case can be made for Full Heal Venusaur if you're playing Petal Dance Giga Drain, as you want to make sure your Giga Drains don't get stopped while you're in the middle of the enemy team. Zero Aura is a strong speedster with lots of mobility and damage. I prefer Volt Switch over Spark as it gives me the option to get in and out more easily and Discharge over Wild Charge because of the area effect damage and shield. In my opinion, the choice of moveset comes down to whether you're looking to take out a single Pokemon quickly or deal a lot of damage in an area. In the recent update, both Spark and Wild Charge have received buffs, so the damage those skills provide may outweigh the utility of Volt Switch and Discharge. However, I do not have any problems killing people with my current moveset. I also like how you can use Volt Switch to do hit and run tactics, or even return to base and heal before switching back. For held items, I use Razor Claw, Weakness Policy, and Focus Band. I find that because of Discharge, Zero Aura plays more as a high damage bruiser than an outright assassin. Because of this, I build him a little bit tankier so that he can survive long enough to get his damage off. Focus Band is one of the strongest items in the game and it can keep you in the fight for longer and Weakness Policy increases Zero Aura's already high attack stat as he takes damage, giving these two items great synergy. I use Razor Claw as the last item as I find it really increases his burst damage by making use of his high attack stat and he's able to activate it multiple times with his skills as Volt Switch and Spark have multiple activations. Just remember to space out the activations for maximum effect. For battle items, I take Eject Button for the extra mobility. I hope you all found this video useful. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, please like and subscribe for more content in the future. If you have any other builds that you'd like to run or Pokemon you'd like to run in the center, please comment them down below.